Right then. Um, hello. I suppose you are all here today to learn how to get into manuscript study. Um, yeah. You may have heard of me. You may not have heard of me. Either is not really surprising. Um, my name is Kendra Brown. I have been translating uh, HEMA texts since a about 2004, and have published all of one. So instead of, here's a list of reasons you have heard of me, here's a list of reasons why you might not have heard of me, which is also to say, I don't know, he, what, what in fact am I trying to say? I didn't rehearse this, in case you can't tell. Um, if you thought that Hema translation was glamorous work. Uh, it's not. I'm completely self-taught, and you can be too. So this is a list of my totally self-taught credentials, of which maybe the most important part is after finally publishing a thing in early 2016, about a month later, I actually got a medieval Latin dictionary, which I could definitely have used in that project. Um, that one published project is the Flores Manuscript of Fiore, also called the Paris Manuscript. And that project took two years to translate a, what is it, 50 page document where each page has five lines of text on it. Um, so, if you're asking yourself, why do I want to get into this? That's a really good question to ask. Um, some things I'm going to talk about today, a little vocabulary for talking about manuscripts, some advice for planning your project, paleography, which is a word I will explain momentarily and is critical to the manuscript study process, and then some information about the manuscript scene, like all medieval manuscripts and not just the ones with combat instructions, some advice for choosing sources, and a whole bunch of examples of cool manuscripts that you could be studying right now. Um, there's a link on this slide if you're following along on the Google Slides or you clicked the link that I put in the uh, lecture responses and translation help channels. You can see the slides and also see full res versions of all of the images that I'm going to use. However, in that folder they are not in order, so you will have to pay attention and figure out which is which. Uh, so to start, some vocabulary. When talking about translations, um, people will talk about the source language, which is the language that the text is in, the reason it needs to be translated. The destination language is where you, the language you are putting it into, so where it is going. Um, vernacular is a funny word that is only used in medieval translation, and what it means is not Latin. Um, as a way to categorize all the texts that are in Latin, and then all the texts that are in German, or Italian, or English, or French, or just all of them together, because there are some things that they have in common because of how the medieval period worked. Uh, on the other hand, the medieval period lasts about a thousand years, so to say any medieval thing has anything in common with anything else is always a bit of a stretch. Um, you'll hear me talk about hands, which is sort of an odd term. A hand is a specific style of handwriting, but it's also used to describe when multiple people wrote in the same manuscript. Unless you know who they actually are, you'll call them hand A, hand B, because you tell them apart by their handwriting. Um, paleography is the study of old handwriting. In this particular case, it's learning how to read all of these regional and time-specific styles of handwriting that manuscripts are written in. Uh, the shelf mark or signature of a manuscript is 
basically the call number, but I realize that that's not actually helpful. Um, the call number is the number that's on the spine sticker on a library book. The shelf mark, more usefully, is a unique identifier for a manuscript that within that collection, the shelf mark will tell you things about it. Like if the collection is organized by languages, the shelf mark will usually have the language in it. Um, but they're basically unique all around the world, so people will often leave off the library name and just refer to things like, you may have heard of 133. That's a shelf mark. Uh, recto and verso. Uh, manuscripts just can't be normal. They don't have normal page numbers. Welcome whoever just signed on. Um, so instead of giving them normal page numbers, each like sheet of paper, each page is numbered that way. And recto and verso is a notation for describing whether you mean the front or the back. So recto, the way to remember this is recto is the one on the right, and verso is the back of that. So when you turn the page, you see the reverse. Uh, foliation means page numbering. It's important to have a special word for this because manuscripts sometimes will have the, the page numbering that the creator put on it, and then later page numbering from a later owner, and then modern page numbering from the library that currently owns it. And so you might say the earliest foliation indicates the original order of the pages, but the modern foliation shows that it got out of order at some point when it was rebound. Um, that's not what I meant to do. Here we go. Uh, digital facsimile, or digital surrogate, are really fancy words for manuscript scans, um, which libraries will sometimes use, and it'd be nice if they would just say scanned version of the manuscript. Uh, finally, the owning or holding institution is wherever the manuscript is now, which is often not where it was created, who it was created for, and so forth. So it's important to distinguish when we talk about the Paris copy of Fiore was not made in Paris. May have no relationship to Paris other than that's where it is now. Um, the holding institution of the Paris Fiore is the National Library of France. I will spare you all from having to hear me pronounce French, but... Um, the BNF for short. I will probably talk about the BNF several times. Um, so let's talk about project design. Sort of what do you think about before you start your project? Um, and also here's a picture from a cool manuscript I wish I had time to study. This guy is clearly thinking about design. He is a uh, hilt furniture smith and he is depicted in the house books of the Nuremberg Twelve Brothers Foundations which is a series of manuscripts full of portraits of retired craftsmen who lived in this particular foundation boarding house. So something people ask me a fair amount is, should I bother getting into translating? Like, everything cool has been translated, right? No. Everything that we talk about has been translated because they sort of international English-speaking community focuses on things that are in English. Which also means anything that hasn't been translated, not even necessarily into English, doesn't get talked about as much. So if there's a text that you are interested in, absolutely translate it, if, if that's what it is you want to do. Um, also, you should bother because all translation is inherently interpretation. So just like it's always worthwhile for a new person to do an interpretation of a well-studied text, it is always useful for a new person to translate a text that they haven't translated before, or to retranslate a text that they have a new interpretation of. It's important to translate different copies of the same text. Um, the Fiore Corpus is a handy example, because no one is going to say, man, the Getty's been translated. We can ignore the Morgan copy. We don't need to hear about it. Um, and in the larger traditions, there are copies that haven't yet been studied closely. It's also important to have multiple translations of the same text. 
Um, there's been discussions going on in the KDF Meyer channel recently about the choices the translators make, and wouldn't it be nice if we had more than one translation to talk about? Because each translator interprets, and if there's only one translation, everyone who doesn't read the original is stuck with that interpretation. Importantly, whether you should bother is really about you. Like, if it would be valuable to you, if you are drawn to do a translation of a text, you should do that. Even if you're not sure anyone else will ever want to read it. Because, you know, you, you do research for you, right? Um, I personally get really hung up on this sometimes, because I only read Latin. Um, I suppose I should say I read Latin and English. I only translate from Latin into English. So... Basically, everything that I've worked on is a contemporary translation of something that's already been translated. But, I don't know, does, does anyone actually want another translation that's harder to read? People keep telling me yes, so I try to stick with it and not give up. But there's a bigger answer to this question. Like, should, a, should someone bother getting into translation when so many combat manuscripts have already been translated. Absolutely, because manuscripts that are about one-on-one -on -one fights are a tiny minority of the manuscripts and early printed books that survive from the same time periods. It is very important to know for yourself, why are you doing this? Um, you, you can't say you're doing it for glory. You can try, but you still have to know what that means to you. And also, if you're doing it for glory, whether that means fame, wealth, followers on the internet, whatever, you need to approach it in terms of each of those things if you want to get that out of it. Here are some other examples of reasons someone might get into translating. They are all different, and each of them dictates a different approach to the project. So you should envision your project based on your personal motivation. But no, really, like, think about your motivation. Um, it sounds pithy and cute, but if you can't answer why you're doing this at the beginning of the project, halfway through, you're going to be asking yourself, why am I doing this? Why am I torturing myself? What am I getting out of it? Um, this is the thing that, when I forget about why am I doing this, I start wondering, does anyone really want to read this? Does anyone, do I need to be doing this? It's really hard, why am I doing this? And staring down that void is much harder than staring down Latin. It's important to know because once you've started your project, you'll have to figure out whether you want to publish something, or what difficulty you want it to be in the destination language. Should it be easy? Should it be the same difficulty level as the original? If you know why you're doing it and who you're doing it for and who your audience is, you can figure that out. Should it have footnotes? Should it, how should you format it? Should it have a side-by-side? -side? Should it include the transcription at all? Where are you going to publish it? And very importantly, try to be honest with yourself about these things. Because if you're chasing a dream that isn't really yours, it will be hard to feel satisfied. Um, a, a cool little medievalism that I learned recently, like the way medieval people might say that, is open the ears of your heart and listen. Um, which is attributed to St. Benedict. Uh, so how can you prepare yourself? You've now decided you're going to do a translation project. These are some things that I have never actually done in advance of a project, but I often wish I had. Uh, read up on the history of the language to find out what it's doing at the time of this text. Is it crystallized as a sort of semi-dead academic language? Is it a living language that's undergoing an active transition? Both are possible. The medieval period is really long, and... At least my experience of not taking any formal classes in medieval translating is it is not anything like the language that I learned in class. It's a good idea to know about popular writing styles of the time. 
If you're going to be dealing with dactylic hexameter, you need to know what those words mean. If you're going to encounter rhyming prose that doesn't look like poetry, but needs to be translated like poetry, that's important to know in advance. Uh, you should find out what the handwriting or typesetting of this time period is so that you can study that in advance if you need to. Uh, find out if there's a dictionary that's available for this specific time period. Uh, translating medieval Latin with a classical Latin dictionary is harder than it needs to be. Um, you don't have to do all this before you start. As I said, I basically never do. But looking into it before you start will save you some frustration and some do-overs and some iterations of editing. And I can say that is absolutely true from experience. I do that a lot. Um, any translation is a big project. How do you eat an elephant? One spoonful at a time. If you're just getting started in translation, you should make sure that your spoon is small when you eat the elephant one spoonful at a time. Um, I would recommend choosing an original text that has already been translated so that you can do a translation and then look at someone else's translation and see if you were close to them and see what you can learn by comparing them. I also absolutely, at every skill level, recommend do the work in small pieces. Especially until you have an idea how fast it goes, but probably in general. On the Florius project, my translation partner and I expected that we would make progress at the rate of one couplet per two hours. So one line per hour, roughly, is usually how it went. Um, on our current project, we expect more like one paragraph or two to five sentences per two-hour session. Um, if this is making you ask yourself, do I really want to do this? Uh, that is reasonable. It's important to examine your motivations and also your frustration tolerance. Um, I see someone has asked in the chat, one line per hour, oof. It's not like literally it takes a whole hour to get from the beginning to the end of the line, but you read it and you look up all the words and it doesn't quite make sense. So then you pick a word that doesn't make sense and you chase down other things that word might mean. And five dictionaries later, an hour has gone by. Um, so we do still work pretty slowly. Sometimes. Sometimes we work fast, that's a surprise, that's great. Sometimes we plan to work for longer sessions so that we can do more stuff. Like we'll do, you know, we're, we're going to do a call on Friday, it's going to last four hours instead of two, and we're going to knock out the rest of the transcription. And when we do that, we always make an explicit agreement that the quality is going to be lower because we're working faster. We also usually agree on what we're going to drink while we work so that everything is equal on both sides of the call. Um, if you're not sure how to meaningfully reduce a whole text <coughs> into a smaller piece or it's not broken up in nice paragraphs, um, some other options to try are just the table of contents, just the captions on the images if it's illustrated. If there are headings, you can do just the headings. It'll give you a warm-up on the language, the actual words, but it won't give you a warm-up on the grammar because None of those things require complete sentences. Uh, however, doing this can help you identify the most exciting parts to focus on, so that if you decide you can only actually do one chapter of this whole book, this way you can pick the best chapter for you. Um, it is going to be hard. I... I was not expecting it to be this hard when I initially got into medieval translating. Um, but medieval manuscripts are written in regional dialects of what were then living languages, even if they're not now. So they're full of new weird contractions. And they use things as prepositions that we now don't recognize as prepositions. And I didn't really understand what was happening in these texts that was making them so different from what I learned in class until I read a modern article 
about modern English that was entirely about the construction, like, I learned a thing today because internet. And that kind of change is exactly what's happening in these early modern texts where people get lazy and they start leaving out essential words or they'll use just half of a pair. And that might be in your dictionary. It might not. Um, context and culture are super important because if you don't know anything at all about them, you're not even going to notice a thing that's an idiom that's weird. There's a line in Florius where, you know, Fiore always boasting about things, and he says, when I am done with this, I will be made to the nails. And we looked at that, and, all right, made to the hooves? So anyway, context is important, or at least it's important to recognize that we are missing context. Um, there will be loan words that are not in your dictionary, especially in combat manuals where the weapon being written about is not from the same culture as this language originally developed in. Uh, or it'll be things that seem kind of obvious and yet are not in the dictionary. The word daga from Fiore pretty clearly means dagger. Definitely not in my dictionary at all. On the other hand, prepare to be wrong a lot. There will be things that look familiar and don't work the way they did in class. Um, structure your notes and documents around your translation process. This may sound kind of meta, but translation generates a lot of text and a lot of notes and a lot of footnotes and pasted links and new versions of stuff. It is absolutely not possible to have an in-process translation also be pretty. So to deal, deal with the in-process mess first, you can make it pretty later. And some things to think about. People will talk about, like, they, they really want to get into translation so that they can study a thing that no one else has studied before. Which is great. I've done projects that way. If you do that, it'll be something that nobody else has worked on. So maybe nobody worked on it because everyone who looked at it said, this is too hard, and moved on to something else. There will be no scholarship you can look up to find out what something means. Um, or if it hasn't been translated because it was only discovered in the last 10 years, that means that no one has done a thesis on it. No one has sent grad students to transcribe it already. So it might not be hard, it's just kind of unsupported. Um, it is dangerous to go alone. This is all mostly true if you're hoping people other than you are going to read your translation, but I realize that that is a major reason why people do translation projects. Uh, so if you're go hoping to publish your translation, you absolutely need at least one quality check reader. Uh, they do not need to be a translator. They should probably be fluent in the destination language, but just, once you get deep into translation, strange things happen in your brain and you forget how to speak. I, I can't explain <clears throat> it. Um, in addition to that quality check reader, it's a good idea to have someone who does have education, related education, take a look at it. So maybe another translator, someone who studied related stuff, or someone who's a professional editor or has serious editing skills. All of those will further improve the quality of your finished product. If this sounds excessive, um, I absolutely promise you will need a person to tell you that abovely still is not a word, belowly is also not a word, and backwardsly is even less a word. Um, other, th those are all words I try to use a lot. Um, some examples from other translators are the phrase garnish the hat, and the word more likely are things that maybe a QC reader might have suggested needed a little more work. It's also just nice to have someone else who's going through this difficult project with you. 
someone you can talk to about why are we doing this? Are we doing this the best way? Uh, so, on to paleography. Your new best friend. Your new party trick. Maybe only I go to those kind of parties. Uh, shown here is a page from a merchant's book, which has calendars and customs information and money exchange rates. It is written in Italian. I can't read it at all. Um, the holding institution here is Harvard University. So paleography is learning to read old handwriting. You can learn this by taking classes online. There are 19th century textbooks about it that are on Google Books or archive.org, that kind of thing. So if you don't have access to a university graduate program that has doctoral level courses in how to read old handwriting, you can still find these out of copyright materials and study it at home. Um, if you want to study manuscripts, but you don't care about doing translations, paleography is still a very useful skill because it will help you skim a text to see what's going on on this page. You know, if you find the page in the book that is the dirtiest and has been looked at the most, being able to at least guess at what the words are will help tell you why this page has been looked at the most. Uh, or you could do transcriptions and not translate if you think paleography is fun. Um, paleography will also improve your skills at squinting to read other stuff. Um, on the other hand, and being able to impress people by reading bar signs from all the way across the bar is not that great a skill. Um, if I have made it sound simple, like it's just reading old handwriting, um, it's so much worse than that. Because every era has a different popular handwriting. Or every region has a different popular handwriting in every era. In some cases, each language in each region in each era has its own handwriting, and a text that's written in multiple languages, or even is just quoting from another language, will switch handwritings, switch hands, in order to pop in a second language and then pop out of it again. In this example page, this is from an album amicorum, a friend's autograph book. Um, this page has Greek and Latin and French and Spanish and something else I can't read at the bottom, and the facing page is in Latin, and every single one of those is in a different hand. Um, you can also see that several of them are using big slashes instead of punctuation, because medieval and early modern people did not use the same punctuation as us. Um, that is a thing I didn't expect to need to learn. All of this is also difficult because early modern and medieval hands have more different versions of each letter, can have more different versions of each letter than modern alphabets tend to. They're full of abbreviation symbols. It, I joke that it's a party trick because people really are impressed when they look at what you were reading from and how well you read it. Um, you don't actually have to know paleography, but it's a really good idea. Um, Getting, being able to read sources that no one else has read before, no one else has transcribed, is basically a superpower for research. It will allow you to quality check existing transcriptions, um, which is very important. I was doing a translation several months ago, like just a quick little thing. Uh, one page from Bella Fortis from the uh, Talhofer facsimile project. Like just, what does it say? And so I looked at a transcription in a published book from many decades ago, and it just didn't make sense. Like, the wrong part of speech kind of didn't make sense. Because the transcriber had not failed to notice a symbol that indicated that an E needed to be added to this word, thus changing the part of speech. Um, it, it's all very exciting. Paleography lets you immerse yourself in the text even more deeply than translation alone. 
So if what you're looking for is to immerse yourself in the text, definitely give it a try. You will also learn to read new kinds of reference books. Um, there's a famous dictionary of Latin abbreviations that is in alphabetic order by what the squiggly symbol looks like. And you look it up by that, and then you find out what it actually means. Um, I sometimes read dictionaries for fun, so this sounds fun to me, but that's me. I'm weird. Uh, paleography is also an important skill for estimating or verifying dates and places of origin. Uh, this was a factor in choosing a, a probable date for the Florius manuscript. As it happens, the hand that it's written in is a very specific transitional hand that was only used for about 50 years. So that could sort of set a window around what year could it be from that could then be further narrowed by things like watermarks in the paper or the fashion style of the armor. You may be thinking, this looks awful. You would be correct. Sometimes this is the boring part. Sometimes this is the fun part. Sometimes it's the awful part. Um, I do recommend if you try paleography, this sounds silly, but make up silly names for the symbols you don't know. It will make it less frustrating when you're trying to look them up or complaining to someone about how hard they are to read. Um, my favorites, my translation partner, are the lightning bolt. Looks kind of like a Harry Potter scar. Uh, the seagull, which looks like when you need to draw a lot of seagulls in the background of a beach scene. And so they're all sort of Vs, but with more wave to them. Um, and, of course, the fleeing octopus, which only has two legs, but looks just like a fleeing octopus. Uh, paleography is also a great way to remind yourself that you are doing a great job at a hard thing, because you can show it to someone you know and say, hey, I transcribed this, and they will say, that's text? Wow. Um, this may look scary. That's okay. You don't actually have to learn paleography. You can study or at least get started on texts that are already transcribed, if you don't mind trusting other people. Many transcribers are trustworthy. You can also study manuscripts without reading them or without reading them cover to cover. You can study things like signs of usage, the placement of fingerprints and candle drips throughout a manuscript, without reading the text at all. You can study the craft, construction, and artifact qualities of a manuscript or a printed book. This is called codicology. You can study the layout and design, if that's something that interests you in your non-HEMA life. There's a lot of interesting stuff in layout and design of early modern books. You can study the art, just for art's sake. Or you could study the techniques involved in getting the art onto the page. You could study the art as evidence of trends in clothing, armor, and weapons. Um, I have been dabbling in a little of each of these things recently. It's really fun, and people actually love hearing about it. Um, let me breathe a little bit. Um, the manuscript scene. It is important to understand that fencing manuscripts are not normal. Most fencing manuscripts we have maybe one copy, maybe a few copies, with more or less the exact same text. Um, and those will be grouped into families of less than a dozen with related texts. Often we'll see significant variation between copies. Like it's when someone copied one text, one book from another, they made a lot of mistakes. Uh, fencing manuscripts don't span the whole quality range from crappy scribbles to crappy art all the way up to gold all over the entire page. They're like, there's a range of quality, but it's not the whole range. They don't use standard layouts. Um, the, the classic like manuscript layout with fully decorated borders and one column wide illustrations, you, we don't see it. And that's weird, um, especially when a, a self-taught manuscript scholar maybe 
checks an introduction to manuscript studies textbook out of the library and reads it. And it keeps making these blanket statements about here is how books are laid out. Here is the order that illustrations are done in. None of that applied to fencing manuscripts. Um, describing physical actions is hard. So the text itself is harder to read. It has harder grammar. It has words used in strange ways. It has technical vocabulary, metaphors, and imagery that like, you have to then figure out what are they referring to? What are they describing? How does that relate to how I'm supposed to move? Like, it is just inherently a much more difficult kind of writing. And it's also fairly strange that we know of a few traditions in a few languages, but not like across the whole continent. Um, in the last couple years, as a, an example of what it's like in the rest of manuscript world, in the last couple years, I've looked at a lot of manuscripts that talk about Amazons looking for pictures of women's armor. And not only is there a tradition of including Amazons, but Christine de Pizan has ways that she talks about Amazons that have specific illustrations and styles associated with it, which are different from the Boccaccio descriptions of Amazons which are different from Trojan War descriptions of Amazons. So there's a whole collection of different traditions, each of which has dozens of copies. Uh, Non-fencing manuscripts often will have enough copies of the same text that if you find one and you can't read it, you can find another one. Um, in many cases, there will be older or younger copies. There may be reader notes in the margins so you can see where someone else got stuck or what they thought about it or whether it related to another book. Um, other manuscripts were often made with a consistent production process where the text was put in first and then an artist would draw in pencil art and then someone might go over it. You would add the gold, you would add other colors, you would come in with fine black lines of details. It's extremely consistent and not in fencing manuscripts. And in many cases, you can find existing research about other manuscripts, which is often not the case for fencing books. Um, at the bottom of this slide is a list of different kinds of non-fencing manuscripts there are that all follow this same, like, sweeping statements, all manuscripts are like this kind of pattern. Uh, and there's a ton of different kinds, each of these groups is also large. I, I think I am not going as fast as I thought I was going to. Um, another interesting thing to translate or study is contemporary records. These are manuscripts where there's only one copy, but often it was intentionally preserved because it was an official municipal document uh, or you know, a, a personal family history, a personal history, something like that. They have a very concrete subject matter. It might be monetary transactions. It might be births and deaths. There's not a lot of room for weird grammar. If there are metaphors, you can figure out from the context of the book what they're likely to be. There will be a consistent vocabulary, and it's often words you can just look up in dictionaries. And in many cases, there's prior scholarship maybe about this particular record, maybe about a similar record, something like that. Um, if you have read, uh, why can't I think of the title of it? Um, Anne Celeste's book, uh, Martial Ethic in Early Modern Germany. The source content that's researched from is these contemporary records. It's records of um, crime accusations and that kind of thing. Um, I read a really interesting paper about the role of husbands and wives in lordship in the Hundred Years' War that was entirely researched from monetary transactions in a particular duchy. So there's some really cool stuff in these records. Um, when it comes time to choose a text to read, these are some different approaches you can take. Um, they're all kind of made up. The point here is really just there's a lot of ways to choose and ultimately open the ears of your heart and chase whatever you hear. Um, 
and do the thing that appeals to you, and you can probably follow that to a manuscript. You'll note that one of these is, choose a meme you like that has early modern art. Then do a Google reverse image search to find out where the art came from, and then look up that manuscript and go from there. Uh, when you know what text you want, you then need to find it. You can search by shelf mark. This does not work as often as one might like, but it's always worth a try. If you know the owning institution, you can search their website by title. Um, European national libraries are great if you just want to like browse. They will often have large collections that cover many centuries, many languages. Their whole institutional mission is connecting cultural heritage to people who want to learn more. And their websites are often set up for browsing. On the other hand, if what you want is to study a manuscript in person, like with your hands and your nose, you will need to choose something that you can actually visit. If you're in Europe, that's awesome, because small towns, large towns, major cities will all have their own archives. Universities will have their own archives that, you know, have 500, 700 years of records that they've been keeping. And yeah, they keep it so that people can read it, so it's easy to get access. If you're in the New World, it is not that easy. You'll probably need to find a large institution near you that has a significant special collections library. In either case, if you really want to study your manuscript in person, you're going to have to be less picky about other details because a collection you have access to might not have a sword fighting book or whatever kind of book it is that you're looking for. Uh, overly honest research tip, start with the National Library of France. They have a great search interface. Their viewing interface is frustrating. You can download from the viewing interface. There's a way to download better resolution pictures. Um, the interface is available in multiple languages, but also can be auto-translated by your web browser. It, it's, it's just a really great place to start. This is also why so many of the manuscripts that I look at for their artwork are French manuscripts, even though I don't read French. Uh, viewing your text. In case you hadn't caught this theme by now, this will require patience and persistence. Um, all of the steps in going from I know what text I want to I have the text in front of me can be extremely unintuitive and involve really bad software. When possible, save a local copy so that you can read the whole thing without waiting for it to load one page at a time. Um, even if you can't download the full res version, what you download you're too small to read the text. Having a version that you can flip through quickly is pretty important. Um, very importantly, if you get stuck, do not blame yourself. This is a giant pain for everybody, and serious career academics frequently complain about this on Twitter. Um, if you're interested in those contemporary records, um, you can look for those a little differently. You can pick the place that you want records from and then find out, does their archive have a website? Can you browse their website? Um, and then sort of poke around. These are also often hard to navigate in different ways, but they're usually organized in a pretty clear fashion. Uh, and now, some cool manuscripts. Uh, so, these are spe specifically examples of ways to connect non-combat treatises to HEMA study. So, if you're interested in regulations and expectations for single combat, why is someone fighting another person? A dueling treatise will help. Here is an example of a dueling treatise in French. Um, if you're interested in non-technical descriptions as a contrast to how combat is described in Hema treatises, you can look for descriptions of famous battles and important duels in chronicles, like the picture on the right here, 
or biographies. I think the picture on the left is not a biography, it's a chronicle. Um, on the right is the time when a knight won a duel by falling asleep. This is a true story. It appears in multiple chronicles. Um, I can't read this text, so that's all I can tell you is this guy is winning a duel by falling asleep. Um, on the left, the red text, the caption for the image, appears to say the death of Constantine. Um, if you're interested in non-technical descriptions of combatants or their equipment, tournament books are a great place to look, as well as romances, which is not like romance novels. It's a category of fiction. Um, frequently will be stories about knights who go out into the world and they go on quests and fight each other. Um, on the left is a page from a tournament book. Something I did not expect about tournament books. Some of them show everyone looking all triumphant and great in their armor like a parade. Others are like this, where what they actually show is the state of affairs at the end of the exchange, when both people have fallen off their horses and one of them has fallen off worse. I think this picture is actually of the winner of this pairing. Um, on the right, this is a King Arthur-related manuscript. It's in French, and I picked this one because I love the fancy fabric that these knights are wearing over their armor. Uh, event planning advice and scoring notation systems is a really cool area of manuscripts that I'm surprised doesn't get talked about more. Um, there are tournament books that include both of those things. Uh, I saw one that was basically the whole book was advice for dealing with the logistics of having horses at your event, like what kind of food you're going to need to have if you're having an event with horses, how many stables you need. Um, these examples on screen on the left are two pages from the same manuscript. It's a collection of a variety of tournament-related documents, um, and it's in English. Uh, the left-hand page is the scoring system for mounted bouts. The right-hand page, um, I didn't read this one because it's in English, but the hand is... A little hard for me to read. I don't usually read hands that have all of these loopy letters in them. Uh, so presumably this is a drawing of a particular event, but I'm not sure. Um, and then on the right, that later colored page is a different mounted bout scoring system from Germany. Uh, the tournament book of Prince Elector Karl Albrecht. Uh, if you want information about how gear was made, uh, how it was maintained, how it was purchased, you could look for guild records, probate records, which is wills and estates, or you can look for war books like Bella Fortis. Um, all of those might have information about what did someone own, how did they take care of it. Um, if anyone finds out why you would put magnets in your helmet, that's mentioned in Bella Fortis. I tried to translate the page, and what I got was you should wear your armor and stick magnets to it, and I felt like I was missing something. Um, these examples on the left is a manual about gunpowder and also guild regulations of the Bavarian cannon masters. Sorry, I don't know why it keeps reverting to the front page. Um, So this gunpowder manuscript is also interesting because the format of the left-hand page looks fairly familiar compared to the German combat treatises, which have the same short red title, long brown paragraph format. Um, they even, this even has similar kind of headings. The bottom two on that page are both ein anders, another. Uh, on the right-hand side, records of the Horse Tack Makers Guild. Uh, this title is really long. Why didn't I make that shorter? 
If you're interested in depictions of circumstances for fighting or carrying weapons, or perceptions of different attacks, like were thrusts viewed as more deadly than cuts, um, you could look for crime and court records, or advice for travelers and pilgrims. Um, this is a lot of what Plusty studied. Uh, this example on my slide is the Basel Original Feud Book. Um, this has been fully transcribed, so that's a great one to look at if you're interested in this topic and not sure about reading the handwriting. However, the spelling is very, very not modern. Um, which I know because I tried to automatically translate it, and it just kind of choked. Um, but this seems to be records of like things that are more serious than petty squabbles, but not a lot more serious. Um, one of the ones on this page was that guy got drunk, and he got too drunk, and it was a problem. Uh, this one is more complicated to explain. If you are interested in mnemonic verse for teaching technical subjects, such as sword fighting, you could also look for other traditions that have didactic mnemonic verse and gloss traditions. Some places to look for that are medicine and soldiering. This specific example is a 15th century Sephardic translation of a 13th century Arabic mnemonic poem, which is about the colors of urine and what disease goes with each color. Um, if you do look at medical treatises, be prepared to read about urine a whole because they talk about it a lot. Uh, contemporary metaphors is a great reason to read non-combat texts. Um, you may have heard Jess Finley talk about her research into hunting treatises, hunting vocabulary. Um, for medieval people in many areas, in many centuries, hunting was just the metaphor of choice in the way that Americans can use baseball to describe basically anything. Uh, I haven't read about this as much, so I can't really give an example, but in general, the whole idea of you get ready for something and then you chase it for a while and then you get close and then you catch it and then you have a party can be applied to hunting and dating and also your immortal soul and people have written theses about how hunting of unicorn tapestries are simultaneously about hunting and romance and your immortal soul in which the unicorn might be a hot girl or might be Jesus. No one has ever explained to me what the one tapestry of the unicorn kicking a guy in the nuts means if it's Jesus. Um, so if anyone's looking for a unicorn research topic, there's one for you. Um, the examples on this slide are two different copies of the same hunting treatise. They are both in French. Um, a more specific example of why you should care about hunting treatises is there are at least two places in the KDF texts that make reference to traps for catching wolves. I don't know if there are more because I don't know that many words for traps. Um, this is something that came up during a translation session when my translation partner looked up a word and meaning number eight was a pit trap for wolves that's covered in leaves. Uh, but if someone looked at a book about hunting traps, you might find more familiar words. Uh, you may be wondering, why is it necessary to study contemporary metaphors and ways of thinking? Like, they're people, right? We kind of understand the stuff about you swing the sword at the person. That's pretty clear. Medieval and early modern people did not think the same way as us. And here is an example. Uh, this manuscript is about an allegorical journey. You should be... Oh. Why? Why is it like this? You should be able to see a manuscript on the screen. Uh, this is Le Pèlerinage de la Vie Humaine, which I believe is the pilgrimage of human life. Um, 
This is interesting for HEMA because the picture on the right side of the screen is the only example I have ever seen outside of the HEMA text that we know about where two people are sword fighting and they're not wearing armor. Um, and it's a tiny background scene in a small illustration within a manuscript about something else entirely. But on the left side of this page is an allegorical scene in which there's a woman crawling on the ground with knitting needles shooting out of her eyes, and two other women riding on her back. One is wearing a creepy mask, one is holding some kind of tool in her mouth. They are greeting the pilgrim, who's the guy on the right, and something important and allegorical is happening here. And, like, it's important to understand something about the, the audience of this book, who may also have been the audience of our combat treatises. Uh, if you're interested in frameworks for being a better and more martial person, chivalry treatises are a great place to look. This particular one is written in French by an Italian noble, Thomas de Saluces, or Saluzzo. Um, it's called Le Chevalier Errant, the Errant Knight. Um, and it is a chivalry treatise that tells you how to be a better person, but also an allegorical adventure. It sounds really cool. I don't know if it's been translated, but... I don't know. If, if this is your jam, here is a book you can study. There are a lot of chivalry treatises. Not all of them are adventure stories. Uh, if you're interested in perceptions of warfare or the history of warfare, you could look at history and legend manuscripts or saints' lives about military saints. Um, on the left is a detail from a saint's life about St. Louis, who was also a French king. Um, I like this illustration because this is the most awkward way to hold a sword possible. And also he's wearing bright orange hose. Uh, on the right is a page from a manuscript telling the story of Alexander the Great. If you've ever wanted to know what if Alexander the Great was a French noble in the 15th century, this is the book for you. Um, in this picture, Alexander the Great is the small person in front of the cone-shaped tent who's wearing kind of a furry hat and holding a sword. Um, that is 16-year-old Alexander. If you're interested in descriptions or illustrations of fencing classes, this may interest some of you. Um, you may want to check out House Books and Album Amicorum, which is, again, the uh, Friends Autograph book um, both of these pages came from that type of manuscript. One you can see, I think you can currently see, um, looks pretty much like, you know, what friends write in each other's yearbooks, but also someone drew a cool sword. Um, and on the left is definitely an illustration of a fencing class. However, it's kind of unfair that I use this as an example. It is such a cool painting, and there's no text that goes with it. Um, I think this is my last example, which I guess is right on time, not counting Q&A. I don't know. Um, if you're interested in descriptions of armor, wounds, danger, or defense, you should check out Prayers of Spiritual Defense. There's a whole category of prayers where they describe, they, they ask God to be armor for various body parts to protect against various wounds. And so this particular example, uh, these are called Lorica Prayers. Um, this particular example is famous for having, like, a hundred different anatomy words in it, as well as a couple dozen armor words and some words for wounds, um, which is also interesting because the way the Latin is written, it appears that it was copied for a female owner. Like, when it addresses, I don't know, God protect me, it's using female endings on the words. Um, that is all my examples. Do you have any questions? Or have I put you all to sleep? Um, you had Latin in, in school, right? 
Yes, I took three years of Latin. Um, I'm trying to think in high school, which when I was a teenager is, I guess, the short version. Yeah, was it useful for translations of Latin now, or did you did you need to uh, learn everything again? A little of each. I don't think that I would be where I am now if I had tried to teach myself Latin at home from a book. Um, I think taking it in class definitely got me comfortable enough to try something like taking on a medieval text. On the other hand, I have had to learn a whole lot. But like the fundamental grammar structures are the same. Um, in some ways, from classical to medieval Latin is only about as different as from American to British English. But, like, that sounds like it's not very different, but also it can be very, very different. Okay, thank you. Um, why, yes, you've reminded me. I put some useful links in these slides and then forgot about it. Um, probably the best starting place would be MemsLib, which is a website project that was started last year to help scholars who are quarantined at home and thus can no longer get to the university library. Um, so that's on the translation resources page. Um, that's probably the best place to start. There doesn't, I looked on the internet, there don't seem to be like handy guides for doing translations from medieval sources in each language. But these links are the, uh, the stuff I was able to find. Um, these are all in the Google Slides that I sent a link for and in the PDF copy. Anything else? Um, if you wish you would ask a question today, you can always tag me on the Discord. Go ahead. Uh, I I just wanted to say that I really appreciate this lecture. It's kind of hard to think of questions. I'm not sure how everyone else is feeling, but it, it's like, I'm not even bilingual. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I really appreciate it because it's really cool to learn about this type of stuff, even if I'm not necessarily going to use it myself. It is interesting. It's really cool. Great. That, that kind of reaction is one reason I do things like this. So thank you. There you go. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Just to Just throw, to one, throw thing one thing out thing there, out there um, um, that Kendra didn't touch on, if you are looking specifically for fencing manuals, there's a place on Wiktenauer where you can find everything that I don't know of a translation of and browse that list and see if it, anything interesting pops out at you. But it's not that there are a lot of popular fencing manuals that have been translated, and there are a lot of unpopular ones that have not or that have had one crappy translation 15 years ago, and nobody ever went back to do a better one. So there's a whole lot of work you can do inside the fencing manual corpus as well that no one has done yet. We've just sort of narrowed our view until the only things we ever look at are the ones that got translated. But I'd say that's less than half of just the stuff on Wiktenauer. And Wiktenauer only has like the 15th and 16th century on it. I can pop that link into the chat, actually. Thank you.
Thanks for the lecture. Great. Well, thank you all for attending.